Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 81 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. My guest today is Nick Gregoriades, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But before we do, let's start with our quote. And that quote is, Each person may see a fight in a different way. They can see more in a primal way. Others they can see in a pure artistic way. For me, I see the pure artistic way, the way that a true martial artist can show his art. And that's from Roger Gracie. Okay, Nick Gregoriades is a Roger Gracie black belt. In fact, he has this distinct honor of being Roger Gracie's first black belt. He's an accomplished competitor in the sport of BJJ and the founder of the Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood, a community and association with affiliates all around the globe. He's also the author of The Black Belt Blueprint and the producer of several highly popular video instructionals such as Yoga for Grapplers and Beyond Technique. In this interview, he discusses his start in the martial arts, training with Roger Gracie, starting the London Real podcast as well as his new BJJ podcast, working with the whole person through jiu-jitsu, correlations between personalities and rolling, his love for kite surfing, coming full circle with his jiu-jitsu philosophy, being unrestricted and new paradigms in jiu-jitsu, and a day in the life of Nick Gregoriades, his upcoming plans to move to the U.S., among other things. So really enjoyed this interview. Uh, Nick's a a super interesting person, and I know you're going to uh, enjoy this interview. After the interview, stick around for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, let's talk to Nick now. Okay, I'm speaking with Nick Gregoriades, BJJ Black Belt and founder of the Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood. So welcome, Nick. Uh, thanks for having me, Marty. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak to me today. So I want to start off by just saying congratulations. I think the last month was your 10-year anniversary for the uh, Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood. It actually was, man. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that. I couldn't believe it when I my business partner actually said to me, "Hey, you know, Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood's 10 years old," and it just blew my mind when he told me because it it seems like yesterday that I had the idea for that. Yeah, so what was your original idea and your your original goal for that? And do you feel like you've accomplished that? Yeah, I mean, the the original idea was just to create something that uh, that I felt could go beyond the traditional models that that we saw in the jiu-jitsu community, which was like these little isolated tribes that were all quite insular and quite, uh, uh, yeah, isolated is, I guess, the best word. And I just kind of realized that with the way the world is going and, and also that combined with the way I look at the world, I felt that we needed something that promoted a different way. And um, I think to a large extent, jiu-jitsu brotherhood has achieved that because there's no there's no political stuff involved in uh in anything we do and the stuff we put out there i like to think that it brings people closer together and, and connects everyone involved in jiu-jitsu 
Mm-hmm. I, I think it definitely does that. And it's all about connection, it seems. And you've certainly accomplished that and, and certainly make an impact throughout the world with that. So well done, my friend. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate it. I also want to congratulate you on your uh, new podcast. You recently started your own podcast, and I really love how you started it. You and Roy Dean, who I'm a big fan of, mm-hmm. uh, did a joint venture for your first one, each of you making that your first uh, episode. So that was that was very cool. Thanks, man. Roy is a good guy. I've got a lot of time for him. I was just listening to your recent edition with uh, Hodra Gracie this morning that you just put out. So fantastic. Oh, cool. I know everybody... If you haven't heard that yet, of course, people are going to really enjoy that one. So um, what brought you to deciding to do a podcast? Uh, so, you know, I've done a few different podcasts in the past. I had one called, well, I was on one called London Real. I started mm-hmm. one called London Real a few years ago. And then uh, I did another one called The Journey with Paul Moran, who's the founder of Open Mat Radio. Mm-hmm. And then I did a third one called a Digital Communion. Um, with a buddy of mine in California and my business partner said to me, he said, you know, like none of the podcasts you've done have been jujitsu. I've had jujitsu as a, as the central theme and you should do a jujitsu one. And I just realized, yeah, he was right. You know, like most of my network is jujitsu people and most of the interesting people I know are jujitsu people. So I've got a built in guest list. So I was like, okay, let's make this happen. Absolutely. I was familiar with the London Reel, but I didn't know about the the others. So I'll have to check those out. I love the name Digital Communion. <laughs> it's a very cool name. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I wish I was as good as at coming uh, at follow through uh, and implementation on projects as I am at, at coming up with like cool sounding names because that's the easy part. <laughs> right, right. Um, I mean, if I had, I've got like maybe a, a folder or a file somewhere on my computer with a list of like a hundred cool sounding titles for things, but like only one point zero point one percent of them ever get made. Oh, that's funny. It's funny. So let's talk a little bit about your uh, your background, your training. Tell us how you got started in your training and your jujitsu journey, and what that led you to Hodor Gracie's academy. So uh, you know, Marty, I I've been doing martial arts ever since I was a little kid. Uh, my dad had a black belt in Shotokan karate. And of course, I worshipped the guy. And I never really trained in karate, but I, I kind of like, I thought I did. <laughs> you know, I, I like thought watching my dad a little bit and reading some books and stuff made me like, you know, an honorary little karate dude. <laughs> right. But I, I, never, I never actually took any karate classes. Um, but when I was seven, I started doing judo. There was a judo class down uh, after hours at my, at my school. And I started doing that, and I, I was a pretty good student. I wouldn't say I was like amazing, but I was definitely one of the better students. And I did that all the way until maybe 14 years old, and then I took a break from martial arts. And when I was 19, I started to do submission grappling, and that was with a coach out in South Africa who'd, I would say, it was probably the equivalent of like a, a decent purple belt in in jujitsu. He didn't train much in the gi, mainly uh, no gi, but he was a smart guy and he understood concepts and principles very well and he was a good coach. So I started training with him and he and I actually, we, we didn't really see eye to eye. I can take res- full responsibility for that. I was just a young, stupid kid, pretty arrogant at the time and we had a kind of falling out and so I just started rolling on my own and then I, I left South Africa and moved to the United Kingdom and I... I wanted to find a place to train and uh, my buddy was my buddy from Cape Town who had also moved to the UK. He had been training at Roger's place. So he said, come check this out. And I did. And uh, Roger was super accommodating, just, just a cool guy. And it was just a good vibe there. So I stuck it out. And you were uh, Hodger's first black belt, I believe, and, and did that in, in an incredible four, four and a half years. Yeah. I mean, so look, it's not like I walked in off the street as like a total white belt. You know, I had, even though I hadn't done classical Brazilian jiu-jitsu per se, I had, I'd done some submission grappling and I'd done a bit of judo, as I said, when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So I, I had like, I was a grappler, you know, I had yes. like, uh, so, I mean, if I'm honest, if I look back on it, I was probably the equivalent of like a blue belt when I arrived. So, okay. um, I hadn't been graded, but I would say technically I was probably the equivalent of a blue belt. So, uh, yeah, 
it is a little misleading. Mm-hmm. I mean, technically, it did it did only take four and a half years to go from white to black, but I wasn't a total chump when I walked in. <laughs> you, were, you weren't a total chump. You had a foundation, and you also, I assume, lived and breathed jujitsu during that time. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> for a, lo- a large portion of that time, not only did I, for a large portion, I lived right next door to the gym. And when I say right next door, like my, my house shared a, a wall with the gym. And for a smaller portion of that time, I actually lived in the gym. Wow. So, yeah, it it was definitely like a full immersion boot camp style thing, I guess. And I was teaching a lot. I think that's one of the things that forced me to, to internalize jujitsu quickly is because I started teaching it almost immediately at like purple belt level. I was I was teaching not only classes, but I was teaching a bunch of private lessons. Uh, and that, I think that really helped because, you know, like Roger would teach me something or his dad would teach me something. And then for the next week, I'd just practice it on on my private students and teach it to them and then teach it in a group class. Nice. And uh, that you know how that helps reinforce stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm sure you learned a, a ton of lessons from Roger. Uh, what stands out in your mind? What's one of the biggest lessons you learned from him, not only on the mat, but anything uh, off the mat as well? So yeah, it's strange. It's more, it's more a, a, a transfer of, uh, of just a state of being, you know, just like I just saw Roger yesterday to record that episode of my podcast. And I've, I hadn't seen him for a while, about a year I'd been away. And I just realized like he's got a, he just radiates a very like calm centered sort of state of being. It's just very pleasant to be around. And I think he brings that to, to his jujitsu. You know, he's very composed. He never panics no matter how serious the situation gets or if he's in a bad position or I just think that that's probably the most important trait that I managed to to identify of his and, and try to model. Nice. Sounds like that had a huge impact on you. One of the things that drew me to, to you and your work was your attitude of continuous growth and wanting to help other people grow off the mats as well as on. When I saw your video or the video about you, The, the Journey Never Ends, it really resonated with me. Some of the things you say during that, for people who haven't heard that, uh, or seen that video, rather, some of the things you say in that video are jiu-jitsu never ends, and it's about perfection of the soul. It's about refinement and stripping away what you don't need. And jiu-jitsu is the lens that you view the world through. So really cool thoughts. Can you expand on, on any of that, please? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I've just been reading a book that uh, my business partner lent to me. It's called... Uh, Karate, My Life. It's by a, a famous Shotokan karate instructor called Kanazawa from Japan. And he, he spoke of, in the book, he explains how everything he did was was about Budo, about this path that he was on. So it was not just when he was in the gym, punching or kicking or doing push-ups. It was the way he moved through the world was all about, was all about perfecting himself. And it's it's like a positive feedback loop. Like as you get, as you become more present and more focused, and as as you become a, a better human being, it usually, if you're studying something like jujitsu or karate or martial art, it, you'll usually see that the same thing happens in your practice of those arts. They become better as well. And I've always thought that that's what that's what we need to focus on is is like adopting that. Uh, that kind of mentality of Mike Bidwell said it to me recently. He said, you, you, when you, as a jiu-jitsu instructor, you want to treat the whole person, Mm. you know, you, you, you're not just there to teach them how to do a triangle because they could just go on YouTube, you know, or they could buy a DVD or whatever. Like it's, you want to look them in the eye. You want to make them feel welcome. You want to make them feel connected. You want to show them the techniques. You want to show them, uh, how to um, integrate into this hierarchy of people in the gym and make new friends. And you, you you just want to help them just, you want to treat the whole person, as you said, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that is, that is something that can, can be missing within jujitsu and other martial arts. For sure. I couldn't agree more. 
Uh, and that's one of the, the things I love about your approach and, and, and some others as well that, that share that mindset. Let's talk about the correlation to kind of continue that thought, correlation between uh, people's personality and their everyday life and their personality displayed on the mat when rolling. Talk a little bit about what you've observed with that as well as how would you handle or approach someone who's awesome with the physical skills but not so great with the, the attitude or mindset. Hmm. Uh, so I think there is, there is a correlation. It's not necessarily a one-to-one correlation. Like sometimes a guy can be really quiet and reserved and shy, but once he gets on the mat, he's a total demon, (laughs) but it's far, it's far more likely that, you know, if he's naturally aggressive, if he has an aggressive personality, then his, uh, his practice of the art is naturally aggressive too. Or if, if like Roger, he's a bit more laid back and relaxed then he'll also be a bit more laid back or or a bit maybe slower is a better word like slower when it comes to his application of jiu-jitsu i think you see it especially uh, you know the the aging process is a good it's a good parallel because when you're young you're usually quite rash and, and exuberant and you have a lot of energy to burn off and you don't really know your limitations and you don't, you're quite naive about the world and your place in the world. And, you know, like a 20 year old guy who comes to jujitsu, like a young athletic guy, he can do things like easily do like cartwheel passes and he can use explosive power and he can just drive forward. Like that's, that's the way he's going through life. So that's the way he's going through jujitsu, right? And then as you, you get older, you know, you hit your 30s and 40s and you, you realize you are mortal and you've been proven wrong about a bunch of things and you realize that you've to continue growing and evolving, you've got to accept that your view of the world maybe isn't perfect and that you've got to keep adjusting and, and uh, adding to it. And you also realize that you're not who you once were and that your body can't sustain that kind of full bore training so you know like just as the way just as like a 40 year old man moves through the world in a completely different way than his 20 year old self does so does a 40 year old jiu-jitsu player train and move on the mat in a completely different way uh, than his 20 year old self does mm. so i think that, that aging is quite an interesting par- parallel for it um I mean, I'm sure that's something you've observed as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in myself, as an aging individual, it's definitely yeah. a lot. when you're young, you tend to think there's one right way. You have the right answer, yeah. and um, that's it. And you barrel through to enforce that one right way on and off mm-hmm. the mat. And then later you start learning as you mature, there are different ways or maybe different, uh, a variety of right ways, so to speak, and, and different answers mm-hmm. to that equation or that answer. So I've definitely observed that. You also speak about continued you know, knowledge or self-growth. Um, knowledge is like feeding a fire, which I really loved that metaphor. Can you um, can you share that thought for the people who haven't heard that before? Well, I heard something a long time ago from a very intelligent coach. He said, "Mastery is a sign of uh, sorry, boredom is a sign of mastery." Right? Like, if if you're bored, you're not growing because you've you you're just doing the same specifically when it comes to jiu-jitsu i guess you could say when it comes to anything in life you know anyone who's been at a job for a certain number of years and it's just become automatic for them it's very unlikely that they're fulfilled right you know they're they're usually quite bored or they're frustrated or they feel that they're not growing and i think that the that same thing can happen to jiu-jitsu as well and i've seen it happen with myself you know if you're not trying to change things up or or using new training methods or maybe learning new techniques or new strategies from different positions you're going to get bored you just i mean i've seen it happen to myself and i've seen it happen to many others there's like a i think he might even be a red and white belt now uh from i'm not going to say which country he's from but uh he was in south africa recently maybe a year or two ago and he was teaching a seminar at one of my friend's gyms and my buddy just said to me, like, afterwards, I said, what was it like? And he said, man, it was it was absolutely terrible. You can see the guy is just phoning it in. He sat on, he sat on the edge of the mat, playing on his phone, you know, like, 
he just couldn't care. Yeah. He could not care. He was just, he was just there to get the paycheck, and you know, at first I was like, that's like pathetic, you know, like, and I still think that's completely unacceptable. Right. But I did understand, you know, as someone who's been doing jujitsu for almost twenty years now, I do get why that's happened to the guy. It's for whatever reason he stopped growing, mm -hmm. he stopped learning, and the result is boredom. And it's reflecting in his work and what he puts out. And I mean, it's his responsibility to, to have identified that and changed that. So I don't feel sorry for him when it comes to that. But I, I do understand how it happened. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you, no, it does. Marty. We, we all are subject to fall into a rut if we just stay on, you know, go on autopilot because the more familiar we are with something – the more complacent we get. And, you know, all growth occurs outside of the comfort zone. But we have mm -hmm. to decide to get out of that comfort zone and there are various ways of doing that. Like you said, a, a different methodology or a different goal or whatever that may be. We have to choose to get ourselves outside of that comfort zone if we want to continue to grow. And um, this could be with, you know, relationships, with jiu-jitsu, anything you want to talk about. Um, the more we're around a certain person or a certain situation, certain training method, it gets routine. And, mm -hmm. you know, Tony Robbins talks about subtle variations of a familiar theme. So you don't have to completely abandon, you know, what you're doing or go get another person or a new art. You stay with it, but you shake it up and you do some variations of the familiar. And that keeps it uh, keeps you in a growth mindset. And I think that's key if we want to keep the passion about what we're doing. Mm, I agree with you, Marty. And it's not, it's not easy. It's no, not easy. It's not easy. And some, some days it's, you know, you're able to do it relatively easy maybe. And in other days it's uh, very much a struggle for sure. Hmm. We're all and I think that everyone, regardless of their profession, I think everyone, if they do something for long enough, they're going to hit that point. Everyone, mm -hmm. without exception. You could be, I mean, a movie star or uh, an accountant or superintendent of a school, whatever it is you're doing you will hit that point and it's your responsibility to either change your vocation or find that new or that find that way to, to reignite the, the love in what you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love the, the phrase or the quote, you're allowed to be both a masterpiece and a work in progress simultaneously. And yeah, that's cool. What I get on that, I really love that. And what, what that means to me is you can be a master, you know, you can be at the height of your craft, so to speak, in, in any endeavor, but you also, and that locks some people into that. You know, let's say you have a high level black belt who maybe the guy you were just talking about, for example, maybe has honed their craft, you know, to the nth degree, but sometimes that makes people not want to look like the beginner in something else, you know. People like mm -hmm. Chuck Norris or uh, Dan Inosanto, I have a lot of respect for because even though they were really masters in their own fields, they went back and started jiu-jitsu, you know, as a beginner and left that ego I aside. Think, I think you yeah. you might have that wrong there because Chuck Norris didn't start jiu-jitsu; he made jiu-jitsu. What, what do you mean by that? <laughs> it's, oh, yeah, it's just a joke. Bro. I got you. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I thought there was something completely I was missing, but I got to, Yeah. Love the Chuck Norris jokes for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. But, you know, for some people, they, they, they're the master at something, but they don't want to go be a beginner in something. So they just stay kind of where they are and they don't grow anymore. But it is okay to be, you know, a master and also a work in progress. So go, go get out of your mm -hmm. comfort zone and take on something new. And that's, that's beautiful, you know? Agreed. What about off the mat? I know you have a lot of things going on and you're very busy, but do you have any hobbies besides jiu-jitsu uh, that you do regularly? Yeah, bud. Like my main – the main thing that I enjoy that really lights me up is uh, it's quite an obscure sport called kite surfing, mm -hmm. which is um, – yeah, and if, if you're familiar with it oh, or not familiar with it, uh, it, basically you have like a wakeboard, something that looks very similar to a wakeboard, and then you have a, a huge kite – like a almost sometimes as big as 10 to 12 meters kite and you use the kite to pull you through the water on the board um and it's it's one of those things that uh i was just in south africa a few months ago and i was explaining to the people in my life that that is that is the thing that lights me up 
like when I get out of the water, I've had a long session of kiteboarding. I'm just, I'm lit up, you know, I'm, I feel connected to nature. I feel connected to my body. I just, and it's something that, um, it took doing that to make me realize because I hadn't done it for about 10 years. I'd been, while well, I'd been living in Europe and I hadn't been home and I hadn't had a chance to do any kiteboarding and I'd forgotten it had been a few years since I'd felt lit up like that, you know, and, I'm, and at the moment I'm trying to get lit up like that when it comes to my jiu-jitsu training. I think the more you train, the harder it is to get to that point where, because part of it is that I'm, I'm not very, very advanced. I'm like a blue belt. So there's still huge opportunity for progress. Like when I go out and, and do a kite surfing session, every time I go out, I learn a lot and I come in, I'm like, wow. I've learned a lot. Whereas with with jujitsu, like you know, today's uh, today I'll be a third degree black belt, and it, making progress is uh, it comes in incremental little bursts, you know, and it's I think it's quite a lot harder to get lit up uh, when when you're that advanced in something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. When you're uh, relatively new or, or you know, newer to something, there's so much more. You see so much possibility. The growth occurs a lot faster. And yeah, there's just so much ahead of you kind of thing. And you experience a lot mm-hmm. of it on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. When you're further along, yeah, the, the you don't see quite as big of, of changes and advances. So uh, yeah, I get mm-hmm. that. I get that. You mentioned your today third degree. Does that mean you're promoted? Uh, Roger's giving me my third stripe tonight, actually. Oh, wow. Excellent. Congratulations. Uh, point, yeah, it's, thanks, man. It's going to be cool. I'm going to head over to his academy and um, teach the class, and then I think he's giving it to me uh, after the class, so that'll be cool. Excellent. Excellent. Well yeah. done. Well done. Thanks, bud. Thank you. I appreciate that, Marty. Awesome. 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 So what's one thing that you've uh, either added or refined or emphasized over the past year or two that you feel like has improved your jiu-jitsu? I know you, you don't experience you know giant leaps anymore, but is there anything that you've kind of changed or emphasized that's made a noticeable impact in your jiu-jitsu? So have you ever heard the expression or the phrase, uh, a return to first principles? I've heard the phrase. Yeah, so, you know, I, my initial, underst- my initial exposure to jiu-jitsu was through that... Uh, coach in South Africa was a very concept focused instructor and so so subsequently I I always used to look at GCC through a very conceptual lens as well like I was always a concept heavy learner and teacher and then somewhere on the line I shifted that and started gathering more techniques and learning more techniques and trying to fill more gaps in my technical knowledge Mm -hmm. and it's not that I turn my back on concepts. It's just I, I changed my focus. And over the last couple of years, I've returned to those first principles, the ones that I've, I think are the foundation of my game. It's it's like I've come full circle again. Uh, something that I, I've experienced with jiu-jitsu is that uh, and any anything that you start to, you, you attain a high degree of understanding and is that you you start out with a certain understanding or doing things in a certain way and then you progress and evolve and, and change it up and then you complete the circle by coming back to the things you did in the first place mm-hmm. and that's kind of where I feel like I'm at now I'm, I'm just looking at very basic concepts and principles in particular with regard to body mechanics um, and that's what I've been focused on for the last couple of years, which has been pretty good. I've been carrying a knee injury for about six months, which has hampered my training a little bit. But uh, when I'm teaching now, I'm also focusing on those first principles. Nice, nice. I think I started uh, kind of opposite from that when and many others, I, I think, are in the same boat where it just kind of got consumed with technique and technique and technique and adding more. And then eventually got more into the concepts, and that's kind of where I'm trying to expand a lot more into now than just that's cool. know, just seeing it in forms of technique. Mm-hmm. See the forest instead of the trees, so to speak, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm always looking for, and I think there will be a few more in my career. I'm really hoping for a few more quantum shifts in understanding. Uh, I think that, you know, there's – that's the way things progress is it's not it's not a linear 
you know, a technique is a technique is a technique, right? And a concept is a concept is a concept. And I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for the next, the next level. I don't know what it is, but I, I know it's going to be a new, completely new way of looking at jujitsu. I wrote an article. This is an example of the thing I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, explain. Uh, I wrote an article recently called "There Are There Are No Bad Positions in Jujitsu." Right? Mm -hmm. You know how we we Jiu-Jitsu or the Jiu-Jitsu that we've run is, is based off positional hierarchy. So mount is better than side mount, which is better than being on – having someone on your back, which is not as good as having someone in your guard. You know, it's, it's like there's this hierarchy of positions. Right. Some are better and some are worse. And we're taught that we always want to be moving up that ladder. But what if – what if you weren't restricted by that paradigm? What if every position – like for an example is half guard, you know, 30 years ago, half guard, if, if you showed like the Brazilians half guard, most of them would be like, if they saw someone on the bottom in half guard, they'd be like, that guy's getting killed, right, right? Right. Like he's in a bad position, but now it's a strong, strong attacking position. And the turtle position is the same. You know, now there's guys who actually like, like Eduardo Tellas, he builds a whole attacking system off that right now. What if one day there were dudes who were so good at being on the bottom of side mount that they actively sought to go to the bottom of side mount yeah. because they had like even for me some I've got this cool attack that um, Jake McGee taught me from side mount it's a counter and I've tapped out loads of dudes with this thing it's like it's sneaky no one sees it coming so it's really really if you had told me five years ago that like one of your biased finishes would be a from the bottom of side mount, I would have said you're crazy because that violates positional hierarchy. But that's just an example of what I'm trying to talk about. What what if we? I'm, I'm looking for a new paradigm, yeah. right? Something that goes beyond the stuff that we've been taught. For the I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the stuff we've been taught, right, but I right. just I want I like that's what excites me about anything I'm doing is that, especially, you know, you you hear it. If you if you have conversations with interesting people, you're often presented with a piece of information that that has that like mind blow factor, right. and you're just like, oh, that just shattered the way I looked at the world. It's just completely changed my perception of what's going on. Yeah, and I, that's that's what really excites me about life, and I'd love to find something like that about jujitsu. You know, and some I'd love to like have an insight into training or movement or something like that and i have had a few you know over the past couple of years i've had a few like insights but i'm still waiting for the big one you know like the the eddie bravo like rubber guard type one <laughs> right. that's what i'm looking for. yeah well it sounds like you're open to it and and you know if you're open and you have awareness then you're not going to miss it when it comes you know you're going to be that's, ready instead of cool. it could appear and you could completely miss it because you're just not ready for it and not open yeah, so. yeah. Like I guarantee that red belt dude who or red and white belt dude was visiting South Africa, the guy I mentioned earlier, uh -huh. he's he's not thinking like that. He's not. He's like, I know it all. Yeah. It's like, or like I've done it all. Very close. And I don't think that's healthy. No, I agree. And you said it. Perspective is everything, and not that the old way of looking at it is wrong. Uh, or the way we have been looking at a situation, but uh, when you shift a perception, uh, it changes the whole world. And it just opens things up. I love examples like that, like the side mount or whatever you want to use. Is you've been thinking about it a certain way, and it's been working for you to some extent for a long time. But then when you change that shift and look at it a different way, and you're like, whoa, this, this is a whole different world. The same position, you know, but a whole different world. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. All right. So what question would you say you're asked the most often? What do you keep hearing all the time? I get I get asked a lot about advice I'd give beginners, mm -hmm. um, which is, I mean, I guess it's the same advice I give adv advanced students, which is to be open and f mentally flexible. I think also the oh, the thing that I try to impart to people is that that one of the ways I, I, I look at jujitsu is through. A, f a framework I call the ACT model, which is uh, ACT is an acronym for attributes, conceptual knowledge, and technical knowledge. Or sorry, attributes, conceptual understanding, and technical knowledge. 
And I think that, as we discussed earlier in the show, a lot of jiu-jitsu players, they only focus on the technical knowledge uh, component of becoming a jiu-jitsu athlete. Mm -hmm. So they think the answer is always to, to learn more moves. You know, so like beginners will always say, what do I do from this position or what do I do from this position or how do I get out of this when a guy's doing this to me? And I think those other two parts, which are attributes, which are your, that's directly related to conditioning, like how strong, flexible, balanced, healthy, um, and vital you are, uh, and conceptual knowledge, which is how well you understand the principles that underpin the art. I'm always trying to get students to understand that they need a balance of all three of those things in that act model. So I think there's a lot of questions that I'm asked that can be answered by, are you balancing all three of those? I'm not sure if that makes sense to you. No, it definitely does. definitely does. I think it, it gives you a lot broader way of understanding the whole picture instead mm -hmm. of just being very limited in what's the right technique for this situation. So, yeah, very nice framework. So I know you're a busy guy. Well, tell us what a typical day is like for you these days. So the thing is, Marty, I'm, I have a strange lifestyle in that yeah, I've been living out of a, a suitcase for four, four and a half years now with no fixed address. So there is no real typical day. Yeah. Um, like at the moment, I'm, I'm at my business partner's house in London. I'm house sitting for him while he's away. And I'm, I'm taking care of the, the, the stock uh, for the Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood apparel. So I'm going to the post office a few times a week to deliver the stock uh, or to, to post the stock out to, 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 for full orders. And I'm teaching about once a day uh, at his academy to cover for him while he's away. But then I'm also recording a podcast a couple of times a week. You know, I'm working on the online aspects of the business. So, and then that'll change next week. I'm going to South Africa, you know, and I won't, won't be doing a few of those things and I'll be focusing on, hopefully my knee will be healed up by then and I'll be focused a bit more on my own training. Um, and I'll be teaching some seminars as well. So, I wish I could tell you what a typical day looks like, but man, it's been so long since I've had a, a routine <laughs> long enough to have a typical day. I, I can't really, I can't really answer that right uh, now. Well, hey, your your typical day is atypical, and uh, there you go. I bet there it, you. it sounds like it's an interesting existence. Yeah, I mean, if I'm honest, I'm I'm starting to burn out on it a little bit now. Oh, yeah. I just said to someone a while back that the thing I like more than anything is just to have my own cupboard and set of drawers just to put. <laughs> put my clothes in yeah um so i'm gonna i'm gonna probably have to take a little bit of a break from this right. soon yeah mm -hmm. but it's been fun it's been fun well it's great to be able to do that for sure uh not enough of people take that opportunity or have that opportunity but uh you also sounds like you miss some of the the small things that a lot of us take for granted like having your own place to uh, put your stuff in that yeah i mean life's such a such an interesting constantly shifting paradox because i know if i hadn't done this i i'd have my cupboard and my two cars in the driveway and the swimming pool and a dog and everything else and i'd be like oh damn it'd be so cool to just leave everything behind and go travel with a bag of on my back you know right it's 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 such a boring and cliched expression but the grass is always greener is <laughs> it's it proves true so often i guess the thing i've just learned is that there is there is no perfect lifestyle. There's compromises to every single one of them. And there's also benefits and advantages to every single one of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another expression to go along with the grass is always greener. The grass is always greener where you water it as well, I've heard. Yeah. So, yes. Love that one. Yeah. Good. All right. So here's a big question. What about jujitsu has brought you the most joy? It's very easy for me to answer that. It is the friendships I've made. Without question, you know, without question, I'm just so privileged to know the people I know because of my involvement in jiu-jitsu. They are almost without exception some of the most skilled, evolved, uh, balanced, kind, and generous individuals. And 
my life would be extremely poor without them. And I, I just am thankful every day that it has allowed me to meet these people. I'm sure you've heard it before from different guests, but it does attract a certain type. I think that it, it attracts people who are looking for something. You know, you don't go to a martial arts class or you don't go put on a weird set of pajamas and let dudes strangle you unless <laughs> unless there's something you're, you're trying to find. You know, it takes a pretty strong motivation to, to submerse yourself in that lifestyle. And... I think it just naturally attracts interesting, uh, interesting, fun, and, and good people. Absolutely. All right. So, what's next for you, Nick? And what would you like your legacy to be? Mm, that's a good question. But like in my immediate future, I'm I'm heading back to South Africa. I'm gonna wait out my. I've got a, a, a fiance is from the U.S., so I've applied for this. K1 fiance visa. I'm just waiting for that to be processed. And I'll have to go for the final interview in South Africa. So I'm going to wait out that process in South Africa until I receive the paperwork. And then I'm going to head over to the States. I'm going to become a US citizen. Hopefully if everything goes according to plan. Yeah. And I'd like to build a, I'd like to build a big network of academies in the US. We've got a few there now, but I'd like to build more, you know, regarding legacy uh, someone once said I cannot remember if I read this in a book or, or saw it in a movie but he said you want to live your life so that when you die even the undertaker is sad Wow! and I love I just love that dude. <laughs> I absolutely love it yeah it's cool right? that's power and regarding legacy yeah yeah man I just I want to fulfill my potential in every aspect, I, I, I just want to fulfill my potential. I want to, I want to get to the next next destination, wherever it is, heaven or <laughs> another reincarnation, or waking up in front of the computer simulation, or whatever it is. I just want to get there, knowing I did what I had to do, you know, and and I did it to the best of my ability, and I I put good energy out into the world. Yeah, I think that that's as much as anyone can ask for. Yeah, and I certainly appreciate that, and I definitely think. You're doing that, man. Uh, I'm sure you. I'm sure you're aware to some extent, but maybe not to the full extent of just how many lives that you touch through what you do. So I, I personally want to say you know, thank you and, and so much respect for you and what you do and the uh, the positive influence you have for people out there throughout <laughs> jujitsu. Marty, man, thank you so much. It's it is really kind of you to say that. It means a lot at this particular moment. It's been. It's been a difficult few months here in London. I've felt, uh, you know, sometimes in life you feel you feel ineffective, and I've I've felt that I've I've been questioning my path because certain feedbacks feedback that I've been looking for hasn't been coming. Um, it's it's been a bit of a struggle, if I'm honest. And when I hear things like that, that people are enjoying my work, it does really make it a lot easier and, and really helps me. So thank you so much for that. Thank oh, yeah. you. Without a doubt, and I. Uh, sorry, you've gone through a rough patch. I know that's that's got to be difficult, and and um, appreciate you, you know, sh- sharing that. I think for all of us, you know, we need validation, and sometimes it can come from within, and that's enough. And sometimes we just really need to hear it from other people, and to to know we are making a difference. And uh, yeah, so just to echo it, uh, yeah, man, you're definitely definitely making a, an impact and a positive ap- impact on so many people. So keep it up, brother. Thank you so much, Marty. All right. Do you know where you're going to be when you come over to the States? Yeah, man. It's looking like I'll be in Tucson, Arizona. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Where are you based, Marty? I'm in North Carolina, Raleigh-Durham area. Oh, cool. I've always, there's a place called Cape Hatteras. Have you heard of that? Oh, yes. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, that's got a lot of kite surfing there. I want to visit one day. Um, come on over. We'll uh, head over there. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard North Carolina is a very cool place. It is cool. And where um, I, I grew up in Florida, but where I'm at in North Carolina is um, it's pretty central. A couple of mile, a couple of hours from the mountains, a couple of hours from the beach. So it's 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 very nice. It's cool. Yeah, dude. Well, so from from when I arrive in the states, I'm going to be. I think I'll be teaching or traveling a lot, crisscrossing the country. I'm going to focus all my efforts on on just teaching in the U.S. So uh, I'm sure my my work will bring me out that way at some point, and Absolutely. hope to meet you. Can't wait for our paths to cross in person. For sure. Do you have any of our online learning programs? I ordered 
the Beyond Technique one, okay. and as well as the um, Mike Bidwell Flow Jiu Jitsu. Okay, cool. I'm going to make you a, a coupon code so you can get our all access pass, which is basically everything. You can get that for free. I'm going to send that to you. Well, thank you um, so much. Wow. My great pleasure, dude. Wow. All right, my uh, friend. Okay. Thanks a lot, Marty. Thank you, you take care of yourself. Hey, yeah. Thank you so much. Let me know much. if you need anything. All right. I appreciate it very much. And uh, long, healthy, happy life. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, okay, my brother. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, sir. Take care. Bro. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, again, I really enjoyed doing this interview. Thanks again to Nick. Uh, what a great guy he is, and just wish him much continued success with all that he does. Stay tuned now for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Okay, time for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Today I'll be sharing thoughts from a blog from Joshua Page from Hickory Academy of Martial Arts. The blog is called Self-Defense for Life, and the subject is your joy and why you shouldn't allow anyone to steal it. So let's start with a quote. Gratitude can transform common days into thanksgivings, turn routine jobs into joy, and change ordinary opportunities into into blessings. And that's from William Arthur Ward. So sometimes people, situations, and just plain life itself seem to have the unique ability of stealing our joy from time to time. They seem to find a way to turn that great morning into a bad day, to put us in a bad mood, to literally change the way we think and feel. Don't believe me? Just drive to the biggest city in your area and wait in rush hour traffic. Or walk into a business with poor customer service or bump into someone in a particularly prickly mood. Each day there's a chance that we might allow someone to steal our joy, to put us in a bad mood, to think, act, and feel in a manner not consistent with our values, morals, and principles. So the question, of course, is how do we stop people from stealing our joy? Well, the answer is simple. No one can steal my joy from me but me. No one has the power to take your joy. It is a gift that has been given to us that's independent of outside forces. The truth is we hand it over when we give into negativity. When someone invites us to join a, quote, pity party and we accept the invitation, when we return unkindness with more unkindness, when we let someone else's negativity rub off onto us. So we have to make the decision daily hourly, and sometimes minute by minute, that we will be joyful, that come what may, good, bad, or ugly, that we will guard closely the joy that is in our heart. Our joy is too valuable to waste, too precious to let slip through our grasp, too important for our health and happiness, and for the health and happiness of other people we hold dear, and even those we don't. Remember, joy is contagious, even if it's harder to catch than a case of the blues. But it's definitely worth spreading. So going through your day, your week, your month, I agree with Joshua Page that you should get up, get out, and start moving. Produce more joy in your life, and then hang on to that joy. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. I appreciate all feedback, so if you have feedback, please don't hesitate to give it. If you have ideas for the show or for guests, please let me know about those. You can leave feedback on the website at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. You can also leave feedback on iTunes, and while you're there, make sure to rate the show. It helps us with our standing in iTunes. If you haven't liked us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, please go ahead and do that. And don't forget to share the episodes on your Facebook and social media. Again, thanks again for listening. And until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.